Hi, Chris. It's so good to see you. Nice um, to see you, Mario. It's been a while here since we've actually seen each other. We've talked. <laughs> it has. And uh, it's always exciting and uh, a lot of fun when we talk. But I wanted to, uh, to tell you about the latest things that I'm doing in, uh, in biocognition. I know you follow my work and I follow yours. So uh, anything that uh, comes up with us, we always like to share with each other. Yes. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing, as you know, with all the patients, the people that you've worked with, how difficult it is to change, how difficult it is to make changes, even though we know that it's for our best interest. And what I find is that it's the problem is that uh, we have a, a brain code and we have a, a, a heart code. So, for example, in relationships, uh, you're in a relationship and the relationship ends in a negative way. Uh, someone hurts you. The brain understands it. The brain knows that uh, you don't want to be with this person anymore, but the heart doesn't allow it and you continue to miss that person. And one of the things that I've been looking into is that the brain has a code and the code is based on reason with a terrain of logic. But the heart as a portal, of course, is based on emotions with a terrain of unconditional love. So it takes a, a time, it takes that lag time to, for the heart to catch up with the brain. And I think that's one of the things that I've been working with, but also looking at behavior, why behavior is so different and, uh, and, and why is it so difficult to change? And what I find is that I've gotten away from behavior change and moving into terrains, the terrains that support the behavior. And for example, um, a lot of psychology is using and psychiatry and even medicine, uh, reductionistic uh, rat psychology. You reward a behavior and you deter another behavior. And what it does is it, it really replaces that behavior with something else, but it doesn't really change the meaning. And so the idea of terrains, think about it this way. Uh, if we think of courage, we would say, well, the opposite of courage is uh, cowardness and, and courage is really valiant and, and, and courageous. And it's not that at all. I think the terrain for courage is valuation, the value that you give to things. So for example, you're on a boat, you're sailing out in Maine where you live, uh, and, um, and you have um, a, a piece of plastic uh, toy or something and, and it falls in the water and there may be sharks, you don't do it. Your child falls, you jump in. It's not courageous, it's this evaluation that we give to things. So if you want to build courage, you don't build it by, by shaming people or trying to make them strong. You do it by the valuation that you want them to, to support. So self-valuation or valuation of something else. You're willing to die for a flag. You're willing to die for an idea, not because you're courageous, but because you give it value. And you see it sometimes when, um, when there's somebody who does a, her a heroic thing, they go in and they save a child. And you ask them, how did you do it? I was very courageous. I don't know. I just did it. Yeah. It's just a process of evaluation of the terrain. Now, I love that you are coming up with this terrain theory, because in medicine, there's a complete reevaluation of the germ theory. So we're moving yes. to terrain theory. And, uh, and so I see the evolution here of humanity out of reductionism. In, in the work I have done, people have said to me, oh, that requires enormous courage. You know, what you've done with, oh, you know, just in the past, speaking out in the hospital system uh, against clamping the umbilical cord right at birth, when in fact, that's the body's natural ability to resuscitate the, the infant. Always kind of looking at what nature would do normally without or naturally, norm is a different deal, naturally, without human intervention. Uh, or as uh, a woman put it in a play that she wrote uh, called Birth, I want what my dog got. <laughs> <In birth. laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, so when I was uh, the first time in my residency that I uh, put the baby in my hands, having, you know, helped the mother deliver it into my hands. And then I just put it on her abdomen, which felt to me like the thing to do. But this was not anything that anyone had done because the terrain theory was not accepted at all. And my attending physician said, 
her finger touched your glove, now you're no longer sterile because we were doing it's the the mindset, the terrain was this is an operative field, and everything needs to be kept sterile because germs are the enemy. And I, I at one time in my life, then I had a quick comeback, and I said, you know, <laughs> Dr. McGovern. Uh, I just took this baby out of the vagina and the only way to sterilize it is to boil it. And, <laughs> you know, it's like the, 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 the flora and fauna of our skin. And I knew some um, uh, studies from World War II where when there was no resources to keep mothers of preemies in the hospital, they sent the mothers and the babies home with what was called kangaroo care. So the mother wore the baby. So she was the incubator for this newborn. And, and they found that those mothers and those babies did far better because first they were colonized with the mother's terrain, not the terrain of the hospital. So this valuation thing that you're doing is, um, it's brilliant because you're absolutely right. It doesn't feel like courage when, like right now, there's a, there's a bunch of us who have been kind of on the front lines of holistic health, we would say, and telling the truth about things like vitamin D and all of the rest of it, um, to, and have been criticized dramatically because of an old paradigm. But when you know it's the new paradigm, and let's take it a step further, and you believe in the immortality of the soul, and that we reap what we sow, and that everyone will be held to account. I've always felt this even for my whole life, which is, you better get it right. Or you're going to have to come back and repeat it, and it'll be hard. I don't want to come back. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's I just want it. Uh, so there's something about that mindset that puts a value on doing the right thing now when nobody is looking because somehow your soul is looking. And I've I've been a student of the of the near death experience for many many years as long mm -hmm. as I can remember because I always thought that it was such a good idea to um, nearly die get the big picture come back and go oh I get it now uh, now I've and I've always thought could we have a near death experience <laughs> without dying like without nearly dying apparently not but, so let's learn from those who have had that experience. And what they all talk about is the life review. And the life review is that every second of your life, you're apparently above your, your body and every second of your life, you review it. Okay, this is the final exam. This is the postdoctoral thesis. How well did you do? So that's a big, that's a big valuation. Now, what are the other examples that you have? Because that's, that's kind of this big 10,000 foot view that I've always had that, you know, has allowed me to, um, to work with this. And also, you know, you worked with my beloved Ron. And uh, so I was in touch with him via the people that I talked to after he passed. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things he said, which was so funny, and this is what you helped him with, which was you can name what it was. It was a, a spiritual framework somehow. And when he, when he got to the other side, what he said to my medium friend is, goes, Jesus is real. I met him. Now, remember, Ron was a PhD, postdoctoral epidemiologist, World Health Organization guy, extraordinarily intellectual, but left-handed, which made him think a little bit differently. <laughs> and um, a data guy who was a wounded Catholic, the way that, that that church used to do that to people. So he went from being an agnostic to a Buddhist. And, uh, you know, and then after he dies, he comes back and says, you know, <laughs> Jesus is real. I met him. 
<laughs> we can never prove that. But he did talk about the life review that you that we all have to go into this place where we relive every part of our lives and account for it. We are, we are held to account, not because there's some judging God, but because the part of us that is God coming through us as us wants us to do the best we possibly can to align with who we really are and our higher purpose. Um, and so one of the things that's not in our higher purpose is to follow the dictates of the culture, as you have so brilliantly pointed out, that cultural portals are far more powerful than blood tests, blood pressure, medical me measures. The belief systems embedded in a cultural portal will be more influential in terms of your physical health than any other factor. So, you know, for women age 35, if you haven't yet had a kid, there's a cultural portal there that somehow um, your fertile eggs just fall off a cliff, which is completely wrong, but that, that portal is powerful or the portal of 65. And one of my favorite quotes from you is, getting older is inevitable, aging, is optional because a lot of what we associate with aging is nothing but the physicalization of the belief system. And we know, okay, so your, your field is biocognition, but it's psycho neuro immunology. And you had to invent an entirely new field of science showing, proving how, how we think how we cognize yes. becomes physical. Yes. So give me another example of someone's value. Right. It probably doesn't include going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, the beautiful thing about all of this is that we are, as you know, from immunology, we're designed to be good. Yeah. So for example, we have, let's say, let's take a few molecules and, and, um, some of the immune cells that say serotonin, the neurotransmitter, we look at oxytocin, we look at dopamine, and someone says to you, oh, I love your hair. And you say, oh, I haven't washed it in three days. You lost the opportunity to get oxytocin, yeah. and you gain an opportunity to bring a little bit of uh, uh, your, uh, um, um, could be norepinephrine or whatever, out of, out of the embarrassment. And that again has to do with the terrain of value. Um, gratitude, the terrain of gratitude is, is value. I'm not valuable enough to accept the gift, so therefore I have to deny it. And that's what, what the cultures will teach you. Yes. If, if you say, mommy, look how pretty I am. No, you can't say you're pretty, darling. You, when they tell you, you, you say you're not pretty and you deny it. Yeah. And so so it's, a, it's a mixed, me psychotic mixed message constantly. So then the immune system doesn't know what to do. Uh, it's set up for, here's the gratitude. Okay, now here's oxytocin and serotonin. Oh, no, no, I guess uh, anybody can do this. And, and it's a shaming, which causes inflammation. So it's an opportunity to create inflammation or to create immune enhancement. And that happens on a daily basis. On a daily basis, uh, for example, admiration. A lot of the research is showing that dopamine goes up the roof. But if you admire with envy, no dopamine. Wow, wow. And you know, that's uh, a friend of mine said, this is how you can tell who your allies are. You start to say, oh, I bought a new house. And then they say, that's wonderful. Why did you need four bedrooms? <laughs> yes. That's contempt. That yes. is contempt. Yes, it you know, is. Where they say, oh, I like your hair. Um, how much did that cost you? Oh, I can get it cheaper over here. Yes. So it's a devaluing, it's, it's contempt. And what your work has done is it names things that we have felt in our bodies, but never articulated. So for instance, your articulation of the three ways in which all tribes wound their members. All right, abandonment, shame, betrayal. And I know that shame is in, associated with an elaboration of 
an inflammatory cytokine called IL-6. Yes. So, you know, guilt says you made a mistake. Shame says you are a mistake. And that's how we control the entire population. But as you've pointed out, in individual pockets, it's different. Like, were you the one who said to me um, something about in the South American countries? It was oh, like yes. with a lot of poverty consciousness in Peru, I believe it yes. was. Yeah, you couldn't really get anywhere, get anywhere <laughs> in Peru. And, uh, you know, and we know that someone told me in the French Canadians, you, you know, it's don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. I remember the first time I heard that when I was a, a resident in the hospital in Tufts, and I was very proud of the fact that by talking to a patient, I actually learned what he believed and it changed the course of his treatment dramatically because I could see what his terrain of value was. I've recently, tell me if you know any research on this because I, I find it fascinating. Why would you, at this, in this day and age, why would you go to China for the Olympics if you knew they were gonna quarantine you for two weeks and uh, feed you terribly? I happen to have a friend who knows someone who's over in the, in the Winter Olympics and apparently the food is, is just horrific and whatever, whatever. But if you are an Olympic level athlete, it doesn't matter. You will walk through hell to win that gold medal. And I even heard a survey of Olympic level athletes and they were asked, if you knew that this performance enhancing drug was going to take five years off your life, but you would win the gold medal now, would you do it? And apparently the vast majority said, oh yeah, yes, absolutely. Because they're, that's a different species. I don't know if you've ever worked with those elite athletes where it's just winning at, at all costs. And that's one of the problems, by the way, my sister was on the US ski team in the World Cup circuit, and she's followed some of her uh, teammates from then. And many of them, if you've done nothing but uh, compete in a sport from the time you were three or four, and then you get up to the end of your career, let's say in your 20s, if you're a downhill skier, what are you going to do then? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same with the with the swimmers, that guy who won, you know, nine gold medals. What do you do? I mean, it's, it, 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 the terrain is, you have only this terrain, Tiger yes. Woods, golf. That's Actually, cool. I've worked with some and, and they, they're, they're in poor health. Actually, they, they have a lot of visceral fat and uh, so internally they're not very healthy and, and it's that peak performance component of it that, that your immune system cannot handle peak performance and it'll do it for a while, but then they break down. And then second, what do you do after you get out of the peak performance terrain and you have to live a, a natural life? This tremendous reassessment of the psychoneurology that's going on and, and they have very poor health. Wow. That, you know, that uh, makes some sense because I've seen these, um, you know, the uh, ultra marathoners, the, the people who are running a hundred miles, they will often die young. Yeah. <laughs> so that it's, it's more of a, so then you have to ask yourself, particularly with the runners, <laughs> I always have to ask, what are you running away from? Yes. I mean, you know, like how much do you, and if you've been around those people, it started for me in med school. I played the, we did, I had a harp and a flute duo. I'm playing the harp. The wife of a psychiatrist is playing the flute. So I got to know them and he was a runner and he was a bear to live with if he hadn't had his run. Yes. yes. So it's I began, an addiction. it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an addiction. Good. Now, how would you do the, Okay, let's say that someone comes to you and they're your basic running addict or alcoholic or whatever it is. How would you help them with the valuation? Like it would be the same with, with weight loss. Um, I had a, a friend who said being thin for her was way beyond the value of the brownie sundae. 
And each of us has to make those minute to minute valuations. And it has to do, doesn't it, with for the disciplined life, it has to do with delayed gratification, somehow learning delayed gratification. And aren't there studies about little kids that the ones who could yes. wait, do you want to explain that a little bit? Because it's interesting to me. Yes, so they, they call it the, the marshmallow studies. And what they do is, and is this, this is amazing, I'm glad you brought this up. They'll have children uh, who are um, three or four, five, and they'll say, um, look, there, there's, a, there's a marshmallow here. They're one and they're two. And uh, we're going to go out of the room and uh, you, can, you can eat one, or if you wait, you can eat both. And just by finding the ones that can wait, they look at them later, they do better health-wise, uh, relationship-wise, because of that delay of reinforcement. So getting back to what you were saying, another concept here is I, I talk about the hologram. And the hologram, the best way to explain the hologram is that the brain will do a, a time-space projection to understand self and the world. And, and as you know, with uh, as a physician with the uh, phantom limb, they lose an arm and, and it'll itch and it'll hurt. Well, the brain ha still has a map of that area there. So that's yeah. the best way to look at it. So you see somebody who's overweight, morbidly obese, and they have to go by a, uh, a door and they have to go sideways. They lose all the weight and they still do it sideways because the hologram has it adjusted. So one of the things that, that I do with addictions, especially with, with uh, food, is that it has nothing to do with the food, nothing. It is some kind of hologram process going on either to protect yourself or either because food is love, uh, you, you go to an Italian family, a Spanish family, you got to eat all your food. And it, so you learn the fabric is that if you don't eat, you don't love. So you have to, and then what happens if you're not being loved around you? Then the only love you have is food. So you're going to eat a lot of food because it's love. Uh, so the self-valuation comes from some imagery work that I do with in, in a contemplative state where they change the hologram. And as you see them changing the hologram, they get very anxious because it's like a new suit. And working on that and then working with the co-authors and all that, we make the changes with, but also with the self-valuation. And, and what is the archetypal wound that that person is bringing in uh, to the to the obesity or to the um, cocaine addict or whatever? As you said, the three archetypal wounds that, that I have never found any, I have all three, by the way, but I've never found anyone who didn't have an archetypal wound of That's shame, right. abandonment, or, or betrayal. I mean, it's just how it is. Uh, yeah, that, um, I had a, a, a person that I was working with and um, she said to me, uh, your, your inner child wants a kitten. And she said, but don't get a rescue. You have been abandoned enough. You don't want to get a, uh, a kitten uh -huh. that's, that's been abandoned because you've already, you've, you've worked so much on that particular wound. So very, yeah. very nice. And that's very true. I, I think that mine is abandonment too. And, uh, but I think that uh, Here's another interesting thing that as a physician you would uh, uh, appreciate is that, uh, as you know, the abandonment wound is cold and you have constriction uh, uh, of your vascular system and so forth, and that's the coldness. And, and you want to hide, you want to hide from the world because you're so, you feel so, uh, so abandoned. Mm -hmm. And yet the one on, uh, when betrayal, you also have constriction, but you're red. But the that the terrain of abandonment is fear. The terrain of the uh, betrayal is anger. And look at how the system dis does a, a, a temperature thing with the same hormones and everything that's causing the constriction. But one is angry and the other one's fear. Wow. Wow. So wait, betrayal is anger? A betrayal is anger. And you can do it with a child. You could, you could see that. For example, you tell them, look, I want you to... Uh, play with my iPhone. Oh, I'd love to. But before you do, you have to do a little dance. And they do the little dance. And you say, No, I changed my mind. They're not embarrassed or abandoned. They get angry. And they should. <laughs> they, and they should. They've been tricked. And, they well, then, that. and that brings us to your causes of health. That right. righteous anger is a cause of health. So that when, um, when your innocence or that of another has been threatened, then the thing that will enhance immunity is righteous anger, but not anger that you hold on to for the next 40 years. 
And uh, I have used that so often when I say to people, um, telling the truth, because a lot of times the truth is not well received, uh, you know, depending upon the co-authors around you. And I love that. That's another quote from you that I think is genius, which is we co-author each other's biology, which is why from that moment on, you know, I learned from you, I don't state my age. And what I tell everyone, what I tell everyone is, it is not that I'm ashamed of anything. It's of that I know, it took me a long time to embody this. Um, but I said to my Pilates teacher, and I've been going there for 20 years, twice a week. I said, look, in my mind, you're 32. You will always be 32. And I tell people, don't give an age after your 33rd birthday. Because I um, know a guy who had a near-death experience. Here we are again. And he went to heaven and he said, if you die after the age of 33, everyone goes back to 33. It's a spiritual mastery path number. It's the age at which Christ died, uh, allegedly. How do we know? Um, but I do know that there's something so powerful about this. And the other thing I say to people is, I don't give my age, I don't want my body to know. Because we, we literally, when I, I was talking to a woman earlier about perimenopause, we did a Zoom, and she said, my mother is this perfect example of the deterioration of the physical body with each passing year, because starting in her forties, she would talk about, I'm old, I'm old. I'm old, I'm yeah. old. And even in, uh, in medical school, uh, I remember a textbook of women's health and they showed the female body through the life cycle. You know, we didn't have iPhones then or I would have taken a picture, but they showed the woman uh, getting shorter and shorter. And then she's all bent over at the end of life. Well, that doesn't need to happen. No, I mean, course. you know, at all. So that's a, a living, breathing example. So then when you go to get your driver's license or whatever, and you have to write down your age, you, you know, you, you do that, but then you say in your head, that doesn't apply to me. That's it right. Just, it just yeah. doesn't apply to me. That's right. Every morning when I wake up, I say to myself, I'm ageless, and I, but I have to live, I have to embody it and, and enact it. But I have to tell you something. I, I do some work with a, uh, a longevity center, a world-class longevity center oh, yes. in Poland. Yes. And, uh, and they were saying, well, you, you talk about uh, agelessness and let's, let's do some epigenetic testing here and see where you look and okay. see where you are. So they did the, uh, the, of course, chronological age, you can't change, but they did, they did biological age and I was 21 years younger. So now they ask me, what is your age? As well, I'm uh, my epigenetic age is 21 years younger than my biological, I mean, than, than my uh, uh, chronological. And so, what is your chronological? Well, 21 years older. That's it. And you don't. And the reason is that we're not strong enough. We we're, we have a, a cultural fabric, yeah. and we're not strong enough to fight the admonition when somebody says, "Oh, you're 50." To fight it and say it doesn't matter. You already fell into the fifth. That's it. You already are in the portal. The yes. minute, and so I've had women argue with me. Well, I think I look wonderful for 60. <laughs> yeah. You see, they're already in it. it. It's like we've got to just stay out of it. Um, because this this is so powerful. Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, I found a quote from hers, and she said it was the worst possible thing we could do to record someone's age over and over and over. And, you know, they, the women's magazines have stopped doing this. I hope I had a hand in it where they would always say, all right, how to dress in your twenties, how to dress in your thirties, how to dress in your forties. It's like, oh my God, you know, or um, one of my colleagues gets crap from her father for having long hair because she's over the age of 50. You know, no, you should get a mom haircut now. You know, yeah. just get some ugly, cheap haircut if you're, you're shaped. You're shaped into the age. And uh, uh, th there's some countries in, in Europe that will give people over 50 a, um, a cane because they're going to need it eventually. And there's some studies, uh, some neuropsychological studies that show that if you're walking with a cane, your body will adjust to the cane 
much faster than if you walk and you notice people walk with a cane and they'll have, for example, they have four or five steps and then they hit the cane on the ground. They don't need it. And I was in California one day and uh, there was this brunch and this man comes in with his cane. He uh, picks up the food and he takes it without the cane, goes back. And then when he finishes doing the non cane thing, he goes back to the cane. That's all cultural shaping. Uh, it, it, but it does, it, he, he's not aware that he's coming out of that portal and becoming caneless, and he comes back and he's back into the cane. <laughs> that, that my, my mother was once on a Southwest flight from Buffalo to Phoenix, and there were many, many, many wheelchairs lined up uh, to get on the flight. So then they're in Phoenix and it's time to get off the flight. The announcer comes on and says, there's going to be, I'm sorry, there's gonna be a 15, 20 minute delay before we can get enough wheelchairs. My mother said, everyone got up and walked off the plane. Isn't that great? <laughs> Isn't that great? That, that's attribution, the attribution that you give to things. Yeah. And that's what shapes the biology. And, and, um, and I think that uh, the idea of, of, of terrains allows you to see that what you've learned is that you have a terrain which says, uh, there's a context and there's a there's a developmental cultural learning. And mm -hmm. within that context and that developmental learning, this is what you do and this is what your biology will do and this is what will happen. Uh, as you know, Ellen Langer's done a lot of work with context and she finds that uh, a need for insulin changes based on the context and, wow. uh, and, and pain medication uh, re uh, because of the context. So you're constantly adjusting yourself to the fabric that you learned but if you're an outlier, like centenarians, the people that I study, they don't buy into that. You ask them, what is middle age? It's a, it's a dumb question. You find out when you die. I don't know what middle age is. <laughs> and that's how they yeah. are. <laughs> Outliers. You know, from the time I first went to medical school, I realized that I was looking for the outliers. So for instance, let's say that you have a graph of bone density for women. And you know, they give you those algorithms that you know you lose 2% of bone mass every year after the age of 30, whatever. And then when you hit the perimenopausal time, boom, the, the density plummets. But on those scatter graphs where you see a point for each person, I would always notice there would inevitably, there'd be some 85 year old with the bone density of a 20 year old. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then I would focus on that one. Just focus on that one or the same with um, the other cultural components, which is uh, it's more likely that you will be killed by a terrorist than get happily married as a woman after the age of 40. So what you do with with those those points on the graph, you look for the one person where that didn't apply or what I say is, yeah, one swallow doesn't make a spring. But if a swallow is there, it's worth investigating. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, and you know, in science, the, the, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, the, um, the arrogance of science, they call those outliers nuisance variables, and they're not included in the clinical uh, studies. Those are nuisance variables. So uh, you lose all the information that's out there, and, that, and that's what centenarians are. They have every uh, telomeres, you know, they have long telomeres, they have short telomeres, so it's not an indication of, 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 of longevity. They break all the rules, and, and one of the consistent things that they have, one of the factors is the way that they perceive time. They have wow. all the time in the world, all the time in the world. I have a friend who's 92, and I asked him if he could come and visit. He said, no, next year, because I'm too busy this, this year. And, and, they, and that projection has something to do with the biology. And, and also, uh, you know, as, as a physician, they say, well, the gerontologist, um, as you grow older, time will pass a lot faster. And it is true if you're not into curiosity. Curiosity, what they call the first 30, is your first love, your first disappointment, your first job, your first making love, all those things. And the brain pays a lot of attention to curiosity, to novelty. Mm -hmm. And when it pays attention to novelty, it elongates the perception of time. So mm -hmm. then after 30, you've had this, you've had that. So you, there are no new things and the time goes faster. But centenarians are constantly, constantly into novelty learning. They have no problems with that. And it's curiosity 
not the gerontology of it. The curiosity is what allows you to elongate. So you want to live your life. I have all the time in the world. And what will happen is your, your psychonominology and your neuropsychology and everything will change you to allowing you to do that. And you won't be living in the urgent present that's uh, cortisol related. You're going to be in the urgent present. You're going to always, there's not enough time. You're going to micromanage and and that is one of the most powerful of the factors that I found with centenarians across all cultures. That is amazing. This, this time thing. I have a colleague who's constantly saying, I have to watch my time. I have to watch my time. Um, I can give you this much, but I, I'm buried. I have to watch my time. Mm. And, and I'm thinking, if you're always under the gun, like there's not enough time and there's too much that needs to get done. You know, I often think about the people in the cemetery. I mean, what, what I said to her once, I'm going to put on your tombstone. You didn't get it done. <laughs> 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 you ran out of time and you didn't get it done. I use one of the little mantras uh, when, when I'm rushing. Yeah, I'll, I'll use, uh, they, they attributed it to uh, Napoleon, but it was really San, uh, Don Quixote, Cervantes. Uh, Don Quixote was uh, was being helped uh, with by uh, Sancho Panza to put on his armor and says, Sancho, dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> and that's what I do. Dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry. And, and, and actually what you do is you change the perception and you actually slow down. When I'm really rushing, I'll do a Zen walk, which is a very slow Zen walk. And then what you're doing is your senses with the movement are recalibrating into time and space that is no longer in a rush. Yes, and they, and they, and they do that. That is really, really true. You can have a tiny vacation. I used to tell women to do this. It would be quite lovely, by the way, in the world, if women could go to moon lodges again and spend the times mm -hmm. of their period uh, with other women and have someone else bring the food and, and completely recalibrate your system. The world doesn't work like that because most corporations run on solar time, not lunar time. And so the mindfulness approach to that is just when you have to go out the door, pay attention to how slowly you can open the knob Excellent. on the doorknob. Just those little things result in a cascade of neurochemicals and repeated enough will change your biology so that you can be in this timeless time. It's what Gay, Gay Hendricks, the psychologist calls um, Einstein time. And, uh, and uh, his thing from his book, The Big Leap is, um, I have all the time in the world because I am where time comes from. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. And, and I think that um, considering time, I, I, unless you're doing time faster than, than the speed of light, just regular time, time is an affordance of, of, of space. It's a duration of space. It doesn't do anything. When you say time will heal, it depends on what you do with time. So time That's is so an affordance. True. And we take it into a uh, an item. We make it, we... We give it a form, like your friend who says, I, I, I don't have any time. It's not time. Time is, it has nothing to do with time and space. It's a duration. But if you take it into, if you give it a body, then it'll work against you. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's, let's give people something that they could do with this, because I think everybody is under this time-space delusion um, I heard once that this speeding up of time, getting, remember multitasking, dumbest yes. thing that ever happened on planet earth. Totally ineffective. And totally ineffective. Yeah. So if we could learn to make time or expand time or get into the centenarian mindset that, and, and one of the things I remember from your teaching with the centenarians, um, they're future oriented as well, which yes. is your garden is beautiful. Wait till you see it in two years. That's right. They're living in the present and in the future and not in the past. Not in the past. I, I think that uh, 
developmentally in biocognition, let's say that you have that, that uh, what I call the urgent present. You're in the urgent right. present. Okay. The first thing to do is to ask, in what context do I speed up and who taught me to speed up either by observation uh. or by telling me that time was pressure or time is money? Where did I learn that? And then I do what I call the theater of change. And I, I get them into a contemplative state. And then in the theater of change, they are the, uh, the uh, director, the main character, and the script writer. And then they rewrite the script but then that's not enough for neuromaps. You rewrite the script and then you play it out for the next four or five weeks. Okay. Neuromap changing completely. And of course your blood pressure will come down and your cortisol will come down too when you do that. But it has to be, where did I learn this? And where did it have a function? I, I believe, and tell me what you think as a physician, but I believe that when you have some, when you're doing something for a sense of survival, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It has a function and it overrides the illness. But once it loses the function, it becomes an illness like fibromyalgia and all these other things that initially had a function to not sleep because you had your grandfather coming in and doing something inappropriate. Yeah. You're not going to get sick. But then that no longer has a function and you keep doing it. I think something happens that allows you then to get sick. I uh, Yes. So the, the sentence there is um, not what what is my illness teaching me it's more like what is the illness you need to learn this particular lesson yes yes yeah and if you see if you see all illness as biosymbolic oh yes you got a fighting chance you if really you do if you go into victimhood then you know i'm i'm a victim of this self pity all of this and then if you do what I consider the worst thing you can do, which is to get into a support group for that particular oh, illness. Oh, of course, I agree completely, <laughs> completely. It's the blind leading the blind. If you, if you're, if you have AIDS and you, are in a, 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 you need a support group, do a support group that uh, uh, works on uh, art or music or, or whatever, but not a support group that is in a consciousness of the sickness of what is your viral load today? My T cells are there. It, it reinforces that concept. But one like, thing I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 you go ahead, you go ahead. Uh, that uh, I think that for healing, as you were saying, I think you're absolutely right on the bio symbol. Healing requires two components. One, you have to ask yourself, what is this illness allowing me to not do what I don't want to do? The secondary mm -hmm. gains. We know mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But the other one that's more important is what is this illness allowing me to do or not to do that I don't feel worthy of? Uh, and that awesome. is the most important because you think about it, no, of course I want to I want to play tennis. But if you're not worthy to play tennis, then the arthritis is going to do the job for you. So the, again, the terrain of evaluation allows you to come out because you're worthy of healing. Yes. Now think about, think about how so many churches have mm -hmm. bathed little children into guilt. The doctrine of original sin. You're born dirty. Yes. And there's not a thing you can do about it except spend your whole life down on your knees or remember in the self-flagellating um, those orders. My mother's best friend had been a nun in one of those orders. So I learned a lot about what they did. I mean, they had some kind of cuff that they put on their arm that was like barbed wire. Uh, she had a flail that they used. Um, cool. You know, those, those movies that you see are not very far-fetched. No, that's right. But, but here's the thing. We, the immune system is programmed for good. Yes. And, but when we're not doing good, we have to have a conscience that this is not good. We, you know, what they used to depict as the angel on one shoulder and the devil on another shoulder. Mm. And, you know, and by and large, our culture has enabled all kinds of things that are morally not upright. It's like, but you, you can't go from a church that tells you you're born dirty 
and therefore you you're going to constantly have to repent that you're in a human body and you're just you know loaded with sin to anything goes and everyone gets a trophy you don't have to do anything everybody just just for showing up so i i believe that moving forward in the human race we will be uh using your concepts of the causes of health um the three archetypal wounds and use these as guidance for how we raise children guidance for how we train physicians uh all of that because you know and i knew long ago for instance that if a woman loved uh, i was involved a lot with hormone replacement and i would know if a woman loved her premarin which is a estrogen made from the urine of pregnant horses and she had done great with it why would i insert doubt in there i wouldn't because it already was serving her it was already serving yes. her when, it, you know when, you know so the value of the placebo that's right uh, i had patients who would tell me that they started taking an, uh, a an antidepressant and the next day they're great you know it doesn't work that way so what i would tell them is that's wonderful now what can you do to help that medication get even a better effect that's right you don't kill the uh, <laughs> the placebo right. well it looks like we're coming to the end of our yeah. time here and uh, i've certainly enjoyed this update for my my own knowledge about what you're into, because I think that your work is absolutely crucial for the understanding of how our thoughts, our beliefs, what we value becomes our health in the physical body. And, and nobody has done the work that you have done in, in my opinion. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your friendship and uh, I also love what you say, uh, that you're an expert on whatever works with women. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And you are. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right. Thank you.